have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn this morning to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 21, really, uh, in this last session. Um, I was going to finish up our series on church leadership this morning and talk about qualifications of elders, but I'm going to put that off one more week. I'm just going to tell you, uh, today's sermon is inspired by a young lady that called me on the phone asking if I could put together some material, have a study with her, young Christian, not anyone that's a member of this congregation. But uh, she expressed to me that she is struggling with her faith, having some doubts, in fact, uh, finding it more and more difficult to, to answer the big questions of life. And her doubt, she said, is leading her to much despair. And she's been embarrassed to admit that, but finally has come to realize that she needed, needed some help. And so she reached out, uh, and I plan to study with her and hopefully help her some, but that's kind of where today's message originated, uh, just some of my thoughts anyway. A few weeks ago, a girl that I work with shared this uh, with some of us. She said that her seven-year-old son said, Mommy, I want to be eight years old, but no more than that. And she said, Bob, why not any more than that? He said, well, when you get old, you die. Fair enough. I mean, true, true that. Uh, but he said some of the kids in his school were eight years old. They were in the class ahead of him, and he thought they were cool. And he wanted to be like them, so he would be eight, but not nine. <laughs> nine was too much of a risk. You know what I mean? You all, I'm going to be 54 this year, so you better pray for me. <laughs> I was thinking about this. You know, it's sobering, isn't it, when uh, your children start to wrestle with the reality of death. And then they, they turn around and force you as mom or dad to try to explain this reality. And they start, they start grappling with this at about six, seven, eight years of age. And I think that these verses that we're going to look at this morning uh, would be a great help to the girl that I'm going to be studying with, to moms and dads who have little kids, and to teenagers, and to 20-somethings and 60-somethings when it comes to answering the biggest questions that we will ever ask in life, questions such as, what will happen to me when I die? And what does it really mean to live? What does it really mean to live and what's going to happen to me when I die? Almost 30 years ago, Bob and I was talking about this earlier this morning, on March the 8th, 1996, my father had a heart attack in the home where I grew up and I was called to come home. And I rushed home. By the time I got there, my father's body was still there lying on the floor, but he was gone. He had died. And I'll never forget this, there on my knees, uh, next to my father's body, I was 26 years old at the time, and I'm going to tell you something, at 26 I was unstoppable. I mean, I was uh, invincible. But it occurred to me for the first time in my life, I felt it. I was looking at my father with my two eyes, superhuman man to me, superhero father. I was looking at him... And it occurred to me that he had lost his battle for life. He was defeated. And for the very first time, I realized my own mortality. And I know that many of you have you've been through this yourself. I mean, uh, when you're growing up, dad is the embodiment of strength, isn't he? I mean, what, can, what is it that dad can do? If your toys break, well, dad can fix those. He can throw a baseball. He can shoot a basketball. If uh, you've got some questions about something, just ask dad because he'll know. Dad provides. He protects. 
doesn't he? I mean, uh, my son, when he was little, I'm just kind of stringing these stories together to paint a picture for you before we get into our text. But when my son was little, I remember going through this process with him at night because he was afraid things would come into his room. He didn't want to sleep by himself. And so I would go into the closet, open the doors, rustle around and say to him, there's nothing in your closet. I'd get down on my hands and knees under the bed and rustle some things around there and tell him there's nothing under your bed. I would jiggle the window and assure him that the window was locked. In fact, I would tell him all the windows and doors in the house are locked. Our home is saved. Our neighborhood is saved. And I would say, look right there, Nathan, across the hallway. That's where I am, in that room right there. And he said, but Daddy, this is to trump me. He said, but Daddy, what about those things that come through the vents? <laughs> he had me. <laughs> I mean, ghosts. What, what about that? You know, windows being locked and doors locked and all that doesn't make any difference when it comes to ghosts. But I would assure him, I would say, Nathan, I promise you, I promise you nothing. I'm not going to let anything come in your room. And if by chance something does get in your room, it'll have to deal with me, not you. And that's the promise of Dad. And dad's promises trump the things that go bump in the night, don't they? We trust dad, don't we? But that superhero, we begin to realize that they're not so much a superhero. They're more human. And here's the thing about that. In realizing how human they are, we realize how human we are, don't we? Yeah. And what ultimately is going to happen to all of us. Dads grow older and their arteries fail and their hearts stop beating. Or they get really, really sick or their minds begin to go. And slowly, they're a little less superhero and a little more human. And in the process, we all realize how that we're not actually as invincible as we think that we are. And that's why I think this text uh, is so important because the Apostle Paul, he turns death upside down, you might would say. And he tells us how it is that we can go about living, how we can live well, and then face death, viewing death not as a horrible loss, but as a great, great gain. Let's read these verses together. Let's begin here at verse uh, 19. I'll have to read off the screen because it's cut off up here. But Paul says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body or magnified in my body. You can just highlight that in your if you got your Bible open there but that's what life was for the Apostle Paul that Christ would be honored whether by life by living or by dying and then he says for me to live is Christ and to die is gain that's the secret right there to living and die Amen. for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain if I am to live in the flesh that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two, staying and going. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. That's what I want to do. For that is far better. Do you see that is far better to be with Christ? And then he says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So in other words, he's saying, I want to go, but I'd be willing to stay. If I stay, that will be good for you because he was going to labor in his flesh for them in order to honor Christ. But as far as he was concerned, personally, his desire was to just go on and to be with the Lord. And then verse 25 says, uh, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. 
Now, I don't want it to be lost on us this morning. You know this from uh, us previously studying the book of Philippians. Paul writes this letter from prison. This is the most joy-filled book in all of the New Testament. And that tells us something, doesn't it? That Paul could be in such dire straits and he could be in these difficult circumstances and yet himself rejoice in Christ and be thinking about helping others to rejoice in Christ because Paul had the right view of life. And because Paul had the right view of life, he could live life to the fullest, make the most of life, and in fact view death as something of a gain instead of a loss. As we think about these verses this morning, there are several things that I want to point out to you. There are three things, in fact, that I believe that we must have if we're going to live right and die right. The first thing is very simply this. In order to live right, to know what life, what to live really means, to live right, and then to die right, I must have the right view of life. Paul says here, for me, to live is Christ. Now, if you want to die right, you've got to live right. If you want to live right, you need to have the right view of life. And Paul's view of life is very sweet and very simple, but stupendous, really. He's saying, here's the meaning of life from my perspective. To live is Christ. I don't know how much more simple you could put that. Paul did something that all of us can do. And all of us should do. You examine anyone's life closely enough and you'll find that they can pretty much summarize their life with one word. Let me just put it to you like this. I'm going to ask you this question. Let's put a blank on it. You put whatever is appropriate in the blank. But my life is blank. <clears throat> for me to live is blank. This, whatever that is for you. Now, some people would summarize their life by saying, my life is money. I mean, that's what they care about, money and the things that money will buy. Others would say, my life is about sex, gratifying the passions and desires of the flesh, these worldly things that wage war against the soul. Some would say, my life is about drugs or alcohol, the next party, getting high. Some would say, my life is fame. Some would say, my life is popularity. Some would say my life is sports. Some might say that my life is my family. Others might say that my life is adventure. I'm just living for the next adventure. Going here and going there and doing this and seeing that and having a good time. And I'm not saying that necessarily any of those things are wrong but what I am saying, what I believe the Apostle Paul is saying is that that is not what life is about. Any of those things primarily no. The foundation of Paul's life was Jesus Christ. That's what Paul was living for. The obsession of Paul's life was Jesus. The love of Paul's life was Jesus Christ. Now this is a strong statement, but I want you to hear this. I want you to hear me. If the gospel is true, and it is true, if the gospel is true and Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross and was raised on the third day from the dead, if He came back from the dead and is now King of kings and Lord of lords, if He sits on His throne at the Father's right hand in heaven, then I want you to tell me this morning what alternative is there to Jesus? There is no alternative to Jesus. Amen. None. None. Nowhere. His name is above every name. He is the greatest treasure in the world. I mean, what are you going to put up against Jesus Christ? I mean, what can compare to Him? Any other option is no option at all. That's the truth about the matter. This is why Paul says, <coughs> Paul says, I'm going to honor Christ in my body. You know what it means to honor or magnify? Literally, that means to show magnificent. Paul is saying, my life, here's what my life is all about, to show that Jesus Christ is magnificent and He is magnificent. He is wonderful. Amen. The Lord Jesus. 
Nothing can compare to Him. Who He is and what He has done for us and what He's planning to do. I want you to think about your life. And I want you to think about Jesus. And I want you to put together... Uh, I want you to put those things together. And I want to make two propositions. Number one, I want, you, I want you to say Jesus alone is worthy of my life. Because He is. Only Jesus is worthy of your life. Number two, I want you to say my life is too valuable to give it to anything other than Jesus. Both those statements are absolutely true. Amen. Jesus alone is worthy of your life, my friend. And your life is too valuable to give it to anything but Jesus. Anything else that you could give your life to is temporary and will not last. In fact, Jesus asked the question once, what would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you had the whole world, it wouldn't compare to losing out on him. Because you'd lose your soul. You all know Pistol Pete Maravich. You basketball fans know who I'm talking about when I uh, bring up his name. Um, I don't know his particular beliefs about Christ and uh, uh, his religious practices. But I like a testimony that he gave one night at a football stadium. Of course, Pistol Pete Maravich is known as one of the greatest basketball players that's ever played the game of basketball and was a true showman. But he said this, For many years, basketball gave me fame, fortune, notoriety, popularity, and pleasure. But it wasn't until I met Jesus that I found life. And I want to say amen to that. Amen. I don't know about all the rest of the details about his life, but I can tell you this, he's right on the money when it comes to nothing, nothing, nothing can give what Jesus gives. And that's meaning to life. Purpose for living. And joy in the midst of the sorrows and sadnesses of life. This is what so many people misunderstand about Christianity. Christianity is not merely a religion. I mean, in the Lord's church, we've, we've labored pretty hard to kind of get things right in terms of collective things, you know, the doctrine about things that have to do with us collectively, the worship of the local church when it assembles, the organization of the local church, its non-denominational structure, uh, the way it takes in revenue and then uses that revenue. The Bible has a pattern for all that. We're very good about doing those kind of things right. But you know what I think the next frontier is for the Lord's church? is for us as individuals to understand that that's not really, that's not Christianity, getting those things right merely. True Christianity is Jesus. Jesus is true Christianity. To know Him, to love Him, to serve Him, to obey Him. As if though he is the greatest treasure in the world, and he is, and that's what it means to honor him or to magnify him in one's life. Christianity is Jesus. And I want to tell you the single most important thing that should be true of your life, if you have the right view of life, it is whether or not the people that are closest to you or come into contact with you, that might be your spouse or your children, your family, your co-workers, your schoolmates, that they see in you by the way that you live that Jesus means more to you than anything else. That's what it means to live. That's what it means to live. Henry IV, the king of France, once said this. He said, the number of our days is reckoned I've often prayed to God for grace, but never for a long life. A man who has lived well has always lived long enough, however early he may die. I think that's true. I don't know if he was talking about uh, matters that are spiritual, but it's true nonetheless. A real life is not numbered in years, 
but in purpose. I'd rather live to 54 for Jesus than to live to be 100 without Jesus. Amen. And I'm just telling you, you've got to have the right view of life. And the right view of life is to understand that life is all about the Lord. Now, in my research for this study that's coming up that I've mentioned to you before, uh, I came across some statistics. Let me tell you what uh, Ricky Gervais said first. Y'all know the comedian, well-known atheist. He's made, made the headlines uh, over the past few years. But he says, believing in something doesn't make it true. Hoping that something is true doesn't make it true. The existence of God is not subjective. He either exists or He doesn't. It's not a matter of opinion. You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. And he said that to support atheism. You know what? More than 200 times a second, a second, around the clock someone is asking an online search engine about God with this simple inquiry. Is God real? Is God real? That's where we've come in our culture and in our society. If you type that question into Google, is God real? You will get 4 billion results in two-thirds of a second. I mean, a digital tidal wave will be generated that creates often more confusion than enlightenment. Now, as far as those who seek wisdom from uh, Siri, that disembodied whatever Siri is, there's only disappointment for that. I mean, you can ask Siri, is God real? And she replies, you can almost see her shrug. She'll say, it's all a mystery to me. <laughs> is God real? Ah, who knows? Chat GPT, you know AI. Chat GPT is asked whether God exists. It offers a shallow overview of competing perspectives before making this conclusion. I cannot give a personal opinion on the matter. Indeed, the question is, ladies and gentlemen, is God real? Is God real? Yes, sir. Let me tell you something. The answer to that question, that's a question right there that you want to make sure that you get a good answer for. Because, as William Provine said, if there is no creator, Randy talked about uh, intelligent design as one of the arguments for the existence of God, but uh, William Provine said if there is no creator, then these are the inescapable implications. And this is what I think is the, at the heart of the problem with this young lady who's expressed that she's having some doubts about her faith. But if there is no creator, these are the inescapable implications, then there is no evidence of God. There is no life after death. There's no absolute foundation for right and wrong. There's no absolute meaning for life. People don't really have free will. That is, if there is no creator. In recent years, the percentage of Americans, listen to this, who believe in God has been declining. According to Gallup, that pollster, he says 87% of Americans say, said they believed in God in 2017, but that number dropped to 81% in 2022. 81%. That's the lowest in American history. In contrast, the number was 98%. In 1967, that's where we've come in about 50 or 60 years. 98% in 1967, when pressed about whether they are certain that God exists, only 64% of adults in America would say, yes, that God is real. And then we wonder what's wrong with our culture. We wonder what's wrong in people's lives. At the same time that the percentages are going down in the number of people that believe in God and therefore don't believe there's any meaning to life, consider this, at the same time, rates of depression and anxiety are soaring, especially among young people. And they are killing themselves at an alarming rate. According to the 2023 report by the Centers 
For disease control, almost 60% of female students experience persistent feelings of sadlessness, sadness or hopelessness during the past year, and nearly 25% made a suicide plan. Some plan to take their own life. The bad news is, is that Generation Z, I mean, Generation Z is a flat on its back. I mean, down for the count. <laughs> With sadness, loneliness, and anxiety. You hear more and more of those words being thrown around by the younger generation. The good news is that this sense of hopelessness is resulting in an increased openness for people to seek spiritual answers like this young lady reaching out to me. That's good news. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, everything hinges on this. Your view of life. You want me to give you a really good uh, proof for God? Just that you can use with your kids or whatever. And I can do it in just, just a couple of minutes. It's a really good one. It's actually an old one. This, this comes out of uh, like a thousand uh, <laughs> since the first century up to about 1000 BC, I guess, or AD. Um, it's called the, I think it's Kalal. Cosmological argument. Kalam, this word here, it just simply means it's an Arabic term, Arabic term that means speech or doctrine. And what this says is there are, there are three steps uh, in this argument. Number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now you'd think that uh, that'd be good enough. That's good enough for me. This did not pop into existence out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Did it? Mm -hmm. No. But you know, there are some people trying to come up with some <laughs> convoluted arguments to say that it, maybe it did. But it did not. Some people think that the universe got here kind of like magic. They treat it like a magic trick, like pulling a hat, or a, a rabbit out of a hat. But uh, atheism I mean, uh, it's the worst kind of magic because with atheism, you don't have a hat or a magician. You just have a rabbit coming from somewhere out of nothing. That, that cannot happen. That does not happen. That's number one, whether whatever begins to exist has to have a cause. And here's number two, <coughs> the universe had a beginning. We know that now. We know it because of mathematics. We know that because of science. And because the universe had a beginning, there is a God. Mm -hmm. If you take this thing and you go backwards with it from where it is now, all the steps that brought it into existence, you have to go back to a point of origin. And there is a cause. A causer. A designer, some materials that can be put together to make this thing be what it is. Let me tell you what that means is that means back behind everything that exists, there has to be an eternal God yes, sir. that did not have a beginning. Mm -hmm. There has to be an eternal God somewhere at the beginning of it all, or else nothing could possibly exist. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is that he's come to recognize that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of this God, this God made flesh who came to show us God. And Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Yeah. And I'm telling you, if you're not living for Christ, you need to reevaluate your life because uh, you're, you're, not living, you're not living life the way it's intended to be lived. Now that's number one. Here's number two. And I'm going to be out of time, so I'm going to have to hurry. Number two. Number two, I must have the right vision of death. <coughs> the right version of death. Listen to the second part of this verse. Verse 21. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
Now the word for gain here literally means profitable or beneficial. Now normally we would say the only people that believe that are people who run funeral homes. <laughs> I think the last thing hardly any of us think about when it comes to death is that it is something profitable. That it is something beneficial. That it's good for us. But that's exactly what Paul is saying. If your life is lived for Christ, if Christ is the greatest value of your life, and you are laboring to magnify Him, when you die, that's great gain because you go to be with Christ. You, you get to go to be with the one for whom you live. But what if you live for money and you die? What if you live for your job and you die? What if you live for your material possessions and you die? That's a great loss because you die. You don't have any of that anymore. But the person that lives for Christ can die realizing and knowing that death is a gain because they've not lost anything. They're gaining something. Paul said, I have a desire. I'm in a strait betwixt these two things to stay, which would be beneficial for you, but I really want to go because I will be with Christ. <laughs> and that would be far better. Far better than what other people are living for. Their job, money, material things, adventure, even their family. I mean, you can live for your family and then you die if you've not lived for Christ. I know this has got to be a hard sell to sell people on death as a gain. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, so foolish as to think that I can preach this that it would be attractive to the masses. I, I get that. But as Christians, though, we all believe that when we die, we're going to heaven. We all believe that if we serve the Lord faithfully in this life, we believe that we're going to go to heaven and we're, it's going to be wonderful there. We're going to spend our time with the one who loved us and gave himself for us. But I'm afraid a lot of people are like uh, George Lewis, the famous boxer. He once said everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And that just speaks volumes, doesn't it, about our lack of understanding of what will happen to us when we die if we live for Jesus. In fact, Paul goes on to make the amazing statement in verse 23, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Now, when Paul says depart here, I look this up. You can go do a work study on it yourself. And I'm going to quit on time, so... Uh, just know that. The word here, depart, means untie. To untie something. Or to free something. And it can be used in several different ways. In fact, it's used as a nautical term in ancient history. It's used by sailors who would loosen up a ship so the ship could sail out on the sea. Because a ship is not built to sit in the harbor. A ship is built to sail. And likewise, we're not built for this earth, this sin-cursed earth. We're built for another place, a new heaven and a new earth. And when we die, we set sail. That's what Paul's saying. When we die, we are set free from this world with everything in it that stands against us. The word's also used as a military term. When an army would pull up stakes and take down their tent, what they would do after a battle is they would go home. That's what they would do when a soldier goes overseas or goes into battle. We call that being deployed. When a tour of duty is over, what these soldiers will say is, I'm going home. I'm going home. We're deployed here in this world as strangers and pilgrims and sojourners. And this is our time of duty to fight the battles of life, to serve the Lord and to serve others. But death is when we pull up stakes and take down the tent and we go home Amen. to be with the Lord. This term is also used as a judicial term. This word depart, it refers to the freeing of a prisoner from jail. A, a prisoner would literally be turned loose and given his freedom. In this sense, we're all in a prison here. 
We're imprisoned in a body that's decaying and breaking down. We're imprisoned in a world that's full of sorrow and death and fears and tears. And when we die, we're set free from all of that. We aren't chained forever to disease and death and discouragement and disappointment. No, <coughs> death will be set free from all of that. This word's also used as an agricultural term. It's used to describe how, how uh, the yoke would be taken off the ox at the end of the day. So the ox could go rest from all the work that it had been doing. And just like that, you and I, while in this life, our lives are filled with work. Making a living, raising a family, keeping a marriage going, serving the Lord in the local church, telling others about Jesus. But when we die, we enter God's rest. Amen. That's why Paul said, I want to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. We could go on and on. Uh, making this point. But let me just share this uh, illustration with you. A preacher said uh, he uh, was called to the home of a man and woman. The woman was dying of cancer. Uh, this guy's name is George Sweeting. And uh, he, did not, he did not know that he would end up being put at perfect peace by this man and woman that he was visiting. But he went into their home and... Uh, this woman's husband told George Sweeting how happy he was about his wife's situation. And the wife expressed how happy she was about her situation. He said, I didn't understand that. She has cancer. She's going to die. And this, he asked the man about it, their disposition, their attitude about death, how they could think of it in that way. And this woman's husband said, well, if she were going to go to Hawaii, he said, uh, do you think that I would be sad for her to go to Hawaii? No, I would be happy for her to go to Hawaii. She said, if I were going to Hawaii, do you think I'd be sitting here all sad, mopey, and crying over it? She said, no, I'd be filled with joy and expectation. And she said, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to go and be with Jesus. Who could be sad about that? If they understand that in reality... That's how you live well, and that's how you die well. Amen. Having faith in Christ for something beyond this life. That preacher said, uh, the same preacher that had that experience said that he and his wife had the privilege of sending his parents to Hawaii. And uh, he said, I didn't realize how excited I would be about them going. I never thought how much it says about me that I was excited about them going to Hawaii. And then he says, first I was sad when they went to heaven. And I realize now that I should have been far more excited about them going to heaven than I ever was about them going to Hawaii. That's so true. Yeah. We've got to have the right, the right version or the uh, right view of life and the right version of death. And that just brings us to this last point, and that is we've got to have, we absolutely must have the right vision of life and death. Paul says, if I'm to go on living, now he wants to depart to be with Christ, but he said, if I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. We're talking about spiritual growth this year. Growing spiritually and that being the production of fruit, more fruit, and much fruit in our lives. Paul says, as long as we're in the body, that's, that's, the vision of life and death that we ought to have. That while we're here, while we're here, living in the body, this means fruitful labor for me. Let me share this with you. Uh, I've been reading this book. Um, it's called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. It's actually written by a therapist. Uh, and I thought I'll read the book because I need a therapist. I'll let you all borrow it when I get done with it. So I know some of y'all need a therapist. A therapist do. Uh, but this therapist is working with a patient who's dying with cancer, and that's the reason I'm reading it, to understand the empathy and um, compassion a little bit better. But Julie, the patient in this story, and Lori, the therapist, they've decided on a plan for Julie to move forward and make the best of the time that Julie has left. 
with the type of cancer that Julie has, she only has maybe a couple of years, but probably much less than that. And they have a, uh, some kind of a plan for how she's going to move forward and deal with this. Lori makes the statement, uh, and I've heard it before, but not in the exact the same context. She says, people are often their most interesting when they have a proverbial gun pointed at their head. That's true. She said that in response to Julie, the patient, saying, uh, Julie said, will you promise to tell me if I do anything crazy during this period of time? Julie said to that, I mean, now that I'm going to die sooner than I ever imagined, I don't have to be so sensible, right? I can just kind of let my hair down. I'm going to die. I can give up all this games that people play. Here's an amazing thing, too, about this. Uh, one day, Julie told her therapist, she said, uh, I began to notice in casual conversation, people, how they talk about the future, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to start exercising. We're going to take a vacation this year. In three years, I'll get that promotion. Can you imagine a person with cancer hearing this, these things about the future? And she knows that she's not going to live very long. She's holding back on doing things that a person would do if they think they're going to live longer. But Julie and Matt, this woman's husband, decided they'd go ahead and live their lives in spite of the cancer diagnosis, even in the face of that uncertainty. And this is what struck me. If they learned anything, it was that life is, very, is, that life is the very definition of uncertainty. And that's so true. So it was decided. This is how she would move forward. Looking death in the eye would force them to live more fully, not in the future with some long list of goals, but right now. And I'm telling you, that's what you need to do. Right now. Live, live the right kind of life. Right now. Make a determination. I will live to magnify the name of Jesus, which is above every name. I will cause others, when they look at me, to know that I love Jesus more than I love anything else in all the world, friend. I'm telling you, that is the very meaning of life. And if you live that way, you can die viewing death as a great game, that you're going to go home to be with the Lord in heaven. Maybe that you're here this morning, you're not ready for uh, death to come because you're not living for Christ. You're not a Christian. If that's the case, we want to extend to you the invitation of our Lord, His loving invitation which says, Come unto me, all you that labor or heavy laden. He said, I'll give you rest. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized or immersed in water shall be saved. That is, saved from all their sins that would separate them from God. And coming up out of that watery grave of baptism, you can begin to live Life in the most real sense possible. Acknowledging the one that made you and loved you and died for you. If we can assist you in doing this this morning, we would love to if you just let us know while we stand together and sing. We invite you to come to the Lord.